people are going to be reading on. Check, 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 check. Can you guys hear it? Check, 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 check. Check, 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 check. Okay. Benjamin Simon. Hi, Richard. Check, check. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. 10, 11, 12. 102, 3, 4, 5, 7, 8, 9. 104.
talk? Hello. Hi, everyone. Hello, hello, hello. Hi. Jack. <laughs> hello. 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 <laughs> can people can people please move in towards the center? We're trying to fill all the rows. Thank you very much. Please move in towards the center. I repeat, towards the center. Oh, okay. Come on in, take your seats. We're going to start in a minute. Guys, we're going to use this one for this panel because it's a little bit louder. We'll figure out the other one later. Okay. We're going to be starting in one minute, so please start to quiet down, everyone. Over your head, guys. Over your head. Just put that over. Okay. Yeah, just make sure you can. It sounds like you can hear Got it. Every time I say a single word, it like goes into my <laughs> joining us today. We're very excited to be offering a day of programming created by our very own students and staff around the issues of racism, identity, and privilege. The goals of this day are to become aware of perspectives that may differ from our own, learn how impactful it is to encourage compassion within ourselves and others, and lastly, to inspire in all of us a need to learn more about many of the issues that students face on a daily basis, even in a town like Brookline. We call this day asking for courage in recognition of the fact that this work does require a lot of courage from those who participate. During this time, it is critical that we devote ourselves to the task of communicating with one another about our realities and experiences and for individuals to examine how their own racial identity affects our school community. We know that it can be difficult to sit in the auditorium for so long, but please keep in mind the amount of time your classmates have put into making this event possible and be respectful. 
Today we will attempt to tackle the myriad of issues that accompany racism, and as such, it is important to remember that all minority groups experience prejudice differently and to varying extents. Sitting alongside us are nine very courageous students who are here to share their stories. Please silence all electronic devices and remove your headphones. Thank you, and let's begin. Welcome to our first speaker, Isabella. Hello, my name is Isabella and I'm a senior. I know what you may be thinking. Oh, look at this white girl. I wonder what she has to talk about in the Day of Courage. First, I'm not European white. I'm from Venezuela and I migrated here in seventh grade. I've lived in seven different places and have attended seven different schools. You can say I've had different experiences. And because of how much I moved throughout my life, I've been forced to be aware of my race simply because of who I am. I know that I'm Latina. I was born and raised in Merida, Venezuela, a town that will forever be my home and have my heart. All of my family and friends lived in Venezuela. Yet I go there and I feel a bit of an outsider because living in the United States for five years has made me more white. In Venezuela, American culture equals white. I already have nicknames like La Gringa or La Blanquita, Little White Girl. My brother jokes that I'm now the whitest in the family even though he was born here in Ohio. While I know my brother's just making a joke, it is in America where these ideas feel more malicious. Since I've come to America, I'm too white to be Latina and too Latina to be white. If you don't fit a certain stereotype in the United States, you are forced to fit one or left as undecided. My skin is white and I am one fourth American, yes. But my great grandmother is native Venezuela, Venezuelan, Yanomami. My grandfather is Guatemalan. My grandmother on my mom's side is Colombian. I am many parts, just being white is always considered most identifying. I am multiracial, multicultural, and bilingual. So checking off just one box confirms that I live in two worlds. This one of Brookline and where I have electricity, food, water, education, and everything is normal. And my chaotic Venezuelan world where my family is suffering without basic necessities. I hide my first world because they clash. The beginning of freshman year, my grandmother died because she lacked blood thinner medication. And my uncle died last year because he didn't have access to chemotherapy. Yet I feel like no one here would understand. And I didn't talk about it. I had no one to tell. I come to Brookline every day and pretend to be okay because the culture shock would be too much for the comp to comprehend. I moved here before things got bad in Venezuela and I'm here so I can help my family, support them, and bring them basic supplies when I visit. You don't have the right to tell me who I am after all that I've gone through, after all that my family has gone through. The experiences I've had in Venezuela shape the person I am now in America. Here, I am white. I have white privilege because I pass. Again, I'm too white to be Latina and too Latina to be white, but I am both. My identities don't clash, rather they merge. You can be too Latina and you can be too white. You are who you are and only you can decide. Thank you. I'm not pale, per se. I'm half Indian, but I read as white. So when I'm asked to put my race on a survey, I feel I need to put down white. For ethnicity, I'll put down other if I'm allowed to, but my race is white, since people see me and treat me as such. And this whiteness is visible all over in positions of power. The U.S. Secretary of Press is white. The President of Fox News is white, of course. And so is the President of CNN. And so is the President of the New York Times. Where, or should I ask, from whom do we get our news? It's not just a question of conservative versus liberal. It's everywhere. Even though we think of Brookline High as extremely diverse, it is still white-dominated. You take 10 students, one of them is black. Almost two are Asian, one confused by their somewhat dismissive classification as of differing ethnicity might sit to the side, and the other six 
are comfortably white. And when you live in the sea of whiteness and look around you, it is almost impossible to see anything wrong with that world. Let me stop giving metaphors and tell you my story. Mine is not one of suffering, not one of hate, not one of fear. Mine is one of relaxation, of easy walks down dark streets at night, of comfortable conversations with police officers, of hassle-free airport security, though not when I'm with my father, who TSA gives extra scrutiny because he, they read his darker skin as one of a potential terrorist. I imagine that, well, let's say, six out of ten of you feel somewhat identical or familiar with my story, so familiar that you wouldn't call it a story. But it is my story. It is a good few of yours. And it is not everyone's. Which is why, despite the fact that it is an easy story to hear, it is one that must be told. Recognizing that my story is not everyone's is something I need to consciously practice. I don't have to connect with the rage of someone who doesn't look like me. Why should I work to change the drivers of this rage when I can sit in my white world and turn my eyes away? Although, I do know the rage when it's my father whose life is made more difficult by a world that I live in. This window is why I'm able to see that not every person's story lines up with mine and that it isn't right. To go against this mindset of indifference is to do something that many in white society, a society of largely unconscious oppressors, often resist. American society is fair, says a sea of voices. If you work hard, you'll make it to the top. But there is a barrier of privilege through which those with white skin are often pulled through. The voices of any number of African Americans, Latinx, Asian Americans, citizens of every corner of the globe, and those of every non-conformer in their identity suffer and push and beat against the bottom of the white and largely cis male ceiling, and still a ladder is not lowered. When will it be not only the responsibility of black and Latinx and Asian leaders, but white leaders as well, to say openly that our country is rife with inequality and hate, and that it is all of our jobs to stamp out the very hate where it begins? When will the white, straight, cis male voices match the others that shout against the system? When will the problems of inequality be seen as all of our problems? While those with white privilege must join the fight, it is critical to avoid the trap of dominating the conversation or perpetuating the idea of the white man's burden, though, of course, the use of man is dated as well. It is critical that white citizens listen and reinforce the stories of those who experience inequality. It is not the place of white people to lead the charge, but they must join the fight and bring to that fight the advantages that their privilege has given them. I am not yet doing all that I can. I don't know how. I don't know what lines I should, I shouldn't cross. And I don't know who to ask. Still, that's no excuse. I benefit from institutional racism, and if I don't recognize that and work against it, that makes me a racist. And I hate that. I bite the inside of my mouth whenever I'm reminded of the fact that by living passively, I am pushing down on any number of others. So now I'm here doing what I know I can do, telling my story, and telling you that my story is a lot less heavy than the stories that I've heard when others take the stage. I am acknowledging my male, cis, straight, white privilege, and that I, of any person, need to look my own birth-given status in the eye and tell it that it is wrong. As of now, that is something I know I can do. And then, together with everyone, we can start pushing the needle toward actual change. Thank you.
I don't. Sorry. I don't own a pair of Jordans. I'm 16 and not pregnant. My skin is not made of chocolate. Am I still black? My father is a college graduate. I take honors classes. I get along with my teachers. Am I still black? I like country music. I'm not the best dancer. I don't know the proper setting to use the word finesse. Am I still black? My dad isn't in prison. I don't celebrate Kwanzaa. I like to read. Am I still black? I'm not angry. I'm not sunsy. I don't come from a shithole country. Am I still black? I wrote this poem a couple months ago. I was led to write it because I had been told that I dance white and act white. I didn't know if this made me any less black. I wondered how I could see more black. Through hanging out with many different types of black people, I realized that not fitting certain stereotypes didn't mean that I wasn't black. However, regardless of how I saw myself, I still felt those stereotypes imposed on me. I realized this this summer when I visited Florida. I had been so excited for the trip. Florida had Disney, beaches, and palm trees. We were also going to see a concert. One night, my mom, sister, and I went to meet up with some friends. We were on the highway and needed some cash to pass through a toll. Since we didn't have any cash, we pulled over and called 911 to help us leave the highway. After we told them where we were and that we needed help, they told us they would send some police officers, but first, needed to know a few things to identify us with when they got there. What is your race? The woman asked. My mom hesitated, then she said, black. What is the color of your shirt? The woman asked. My mom told the woman she was wearing a dress. Then the lady asked what the make of our car was. After my mom told her, the responder told us there would be a police officer coming to us soon. When my mom hung up the phone, she was upset. And this sparked a conversation between us on why the police officers needed to first ask about our race and not the make and color of our car. Wasn't that more important? Um, once the responder found out my mom was wearing a dress, not a shirt, she didn't seem to care what the color of my mom's dress was. Why didn't she care anymore? When I processed all of this, I was upset. I wanted to leave, leave the highway, leave Florida, but I couldn't. So we waited for the police officers to come. And what would happen when they did come, I thought. Would they be racist? Would I be safe? I got so lost in my thoughts that I didn't realize we had been waiting for 40 minutes. My mom called again. She told the woman on the phone that we felt unsafe. The woman on the phone assured us that the police officer would be with us soon. My mom hung up the phone. In that moment, I saw Florida in a very different way. This time, I saw Florida where a man in his 40s shot and killed a black teenage boy because he felt threatened. A Florida where so many black people have been killed under the pretense of the stand your ground law. A state where the white candidate who warns people not to monkey this up by voting for his black opponent is the one that wins the election. After 20 minutes more of waiting, we called the rental car company and they assured us that we wouldn't, wouldn't be charged a fee for going through the toll without cash. After an hour, we finally got off the highway and the cops never came. To be honest, I'm glad they never did. I was more terrified about what would happen when they came than being unprotected in a car on the highway in a foreign city. I am not dangerous, I am not a criminal, I don't want to become a number. I want to go into STEM, I want to go to college and med school, I want to add positively to my community. Yes, I am still black. Hello? Okay. Hi, my name is Anjali Matthew, and I'm a junior. And in second grade, a few of my friends and I called a black kid Carpethead. And since I remembered that a while ago, it hasn't sat right with me. Now granted, the kid's ha hair was short and cur curiously textured, and all we wanted was to rub our grubby hands over it, which we did, because no adult told us not to. We didn't see anything wrong with it, and anyway, it was all in good fun. Lately though, I've been thinking about the lasting impacts of childhood. What did our actions tell that kid? Was it a one-off incident that didn't matter or didn't make him feel uncomfortable or objectified or insecure? Did he continue to feel that way when other kids touched his hair? I don't know. Maybe he didn't care. But maybe it weighed on him. 
Maybe his identity weighed on him. Either way, he deserves an apology, especially because I know what it feels like to have your identity weigh on you. I am multiracial. Though born and raised in, my, in Nigeria, my dad is from India, while my mom's family is American, though originally from Norway and Denmark. Being multiracial is a little bit like being in a gray area, never secure in your own culture, never quite fitting into what people expect of you. In my mom's family, I'm the brown kid among the white cousins. In my dad's family, if they're the curry, I'm the drop of yogurt on the side, and, and more than just skin tone. I've always felt like I've been distanced from my Indian family and culture because I'm the American one. But despite that distance, I still felt an expectation to live up to this stereotypical cultural Indian standard of academia. While my parents never actually pressured me, I always felt like I had to be the best in everything I did. I remember in eighth grade, I cried in the bathroom because I got an 88% on the math test and I thought my dad would be mad. I thought, how am I ever going to be good enough? It made me anxious and insecure. An 88% in math now is cause for celebration, and I know that my family cares a lot more about how I feel than any test. This change isn't because there's been a shift in the Indian standard, but it's because I realized it didn't exist. My parents have only ever encouraged me to succeed out of love. There was no pressure behind it. So then, why did I feel this expectation in the first place? Besides my family role models, the surprising culprit was the American expectation of kids like me. In middle school, I was automatically put into the smart Asian group of kids. People assumed I'd be a lot more Indian than I was, be smarter, more reserved, less athletic, and speak Hindi or something. It's like they were trying to fit me into a box of just Indian, which didn't make sense to me, just as just American wouldn't make sense either. But reconciling that gray area between the two parts of my identity didn't make sense to other people, making me acutely aware that I didn't fit into anyone's expectations of me, and that I never could. And so I traded the insecurities of the Indian standard for those of the American one. But this time, I had a notion that being multicultural was bad. I felt like I didn't fit in and that no one would understand me or any of that middle school crap. My solution to dealing with these ideas was to try and embrace that gray area of my identity. But I wasn't sure how I could do that when I didn't know what my identity meant to me. So in an attempt to cover up for my insecurities, I tried to own all of my eccentricities and parts of my identity I was actually sure of. I thought that by accentuating what I was confident in, I could fabricate confidence. So I didn't have to think about how uncomfortable I felt. And now I have another apology, this time to all the people who knew me in middle school because I was so aggravating. In my quest for confidence, I flaunted my smarts, showed off my athleticism, and generally exaggerated my already obnoxious personality, deciding that that's what set me apart. Not my insecurities, but my attitude and tenacity. And if other people couldn't deal with it, so be it. I started overcompensating for feeling like I didn't fit in. I decided that it wasn't that I didn't fit in, it was that everyone else fit in too much. They were all basic bitch conformists, whereas I was unique. I was better than them. I scoffed at their pop culture and makeup out of jealousy. I was aloof, sardonic, arrogant, and condescending, and in the end, I was the bitch. While coming to terms with my identity was certainly stressful, at the end of the day, I'm thankful. My house is an amazing mix of cultures, and I get exposure to so many different perspectives and all the delicious advantages that Indian, Nigerian, American, Norwegian, and Danish cultures have to offer. I've also gotten a deeper understanding of how much we internalize the implicit messages our culture has told us. I internalize other people's expectations of who I was supposed to be, and it hurt. But it's given me a deeper awareness of my own actions and what can result from them. So, to that former second grader, again, I'm sorry. I will never understand what you've experienced, but as someone who's dealt with insecurities about identity, I'm here for you. I've learned, I've grown, and I'll continue trying to understand. Thank you. In this speech, I'll be talking about our psychological defenses and how they relate to racism. Estefan Azuri Mizjoun is a black Brooklyn police officer who walked away from the BPD. It got so bad that he and a black colleague left the force in 2015. This is truly disheartening for me that an individual was prevented from pursuing his dreams because people were nasty and racist towards him, which in all circumstances is unacceptable. 
I hope this oration will help clarify where the boundaries of racism are blurred and to heal the scars of this community and defend against future racist events and behaviors. I'm going to talk about negative, defensive, and racist thought traps that we fall into. Sometimes giving into our negative emotions and our defenses can make us forget our identity and courage, consequently making us act in a way we shouldn't, in some cases in racist ways. One defense is projection. When you don't know if your friend doesn't like you, it is tempting to attribute a feeling to him. The borders are confused. So we replace the reality of not knowing with assuming the worst thought, which is, he doesn't like me. We replace our uncertainty with the worst assumption, which involves our projecting onto someone else our fear and negativity. This can put you in the most defensive position, which is not always useful. Without defenses, however, we are like a crustacean without a shell. So dealing with them must be done gradually. The overly defended individual may split experiences into all good and all bad categories, with no tolerance for complexity. When this splitting is combined with projecting, the undesirable qualities that the splitter unconsciously perceives in himself are attributed to another. For example, you just failed your test and you feel stupid, so you call your friend stupid. With racism, people project onto others of people of different backgrounds and label them bad. Let's take a look at Germany leading up to the Holocaust. Nazis said that all Aryans were supreme or the Herrenmensch, which means the master human being. They demonized, ostracized, and blacklisted Jews among other minorities. They had endured crippling reparation, economic stagnation, and inflation, making them insecure. Unsure of themselves, they split off and projected onto others what they feared were negative qualities of themselves. Another problem arises when defenses fail and the id takes over. The id. The id is a selfish, childish, pleasure-oriented part of the personality with no ability to delay gratification. It is full of impulses. If we acted on all of them, we would get into real trouble, a real mess. Giving into the impulses feel gratifying at first, but will only make you feel worse in the long run as a result of it contributing to chaos. Intellectualization, another defense, can be used to justify bad behavior. Intellectualization involves concentrating on the components of a situation so as to distance oneself from the emotions it provokes. How does this apply to racism? Racists have used Darwin's theory of evolution to say that Africans are less evolved. Someone might think that because people of African descent have a dark skin, it means they are less evolved. No, that is wrong. We need to put things in perspective. People cook up all sorts of pseudo-intellectual theories of why they are better than the rest. Intellectualizing thoughts about Africans were used to justify racist attitudes towards them. Related to intellectualization is rationalization or is what people think are the reasons for what they are doing. An example is people think they need to protect their race. The real reason is they have fear. A fear that the population of Africa is expanding and is going to take over the white race could lead to a feeling that they have to be suppressed. Another point is that people get into an either or bind. This relates to racism because some racists believe that they have to either worship or despise people of different backgrounds. They are only nice to one group in a manner that is either or. Absolutely no love given to opposing groups and all the love given to my group. We can't objectify people. We all have our strengths and weaknesses and we need to work together to focus on the positives and not be discouraged by little things that we project our intolerable discontent on. How can one decide to what extent they should connect with one group and disconnect with another in order to not fall into the either or bind? One can be yourself. That means when you're doing something wrong, you're going to stay you and do you. Actually, you can just be normal and try not to be reactive to your environment. And if other people are racist, don't internalize it. Anxiety will always be there, and there's no way of avoiding it. A little bit is actually good to have. Meanwhile, we can be mature by being accepting, respectful, and tolerant. This is how we can be courageous. Include all people of different backgrounds, disabled, and persons from the LGBTQA plus community. We should not make uninformed judgments and assumptions. There's absolutely no understandable reason that can justify someone to act in a remotely racist manner. Challenge your negative thoughts. Be a reformed person who will not be dismissive of someone else. Maintain those boundaries. Hi everyone, 
My name is Katherine O'Connor. I use they, them pronouns, and I'm a sophomore here at Brookline High School. You might know me as the uptight social justice warrior, or perhaps even the annoying person who always has their hand raised in your classes. Asking for Courage Day is about being proud of one's racial identity. So I'm pretty white to be here, right? <laughs> if there was a melanin measure, I'd pr definitely be among the palest. Even Brazilians call me Brancela. Um, and people always do a double take when I mention my Indian, the Indian side of my family. I stand before you as someone who does not fit in. A year ago, I was standing here at Asking for Courage Day, sitting, listening to an assembly about women of color. At the end of the assembly, they asked for all of the women of color in the room to stand up. I immediately felt uncomfortable. I still remember the blushing feeling in my cheeks, not quite out of embarrassment, but rather I wondered, would other people see me as a person of color? My mother is a strong Brazilian woman sitting in the front row. We often joke about her being the Latina, stereotypical Latina soccer mom. I live with her and my stepfather, who's right next to her, an Indian Brahmin. My dad, on the other hand, um, is your classic Irish white guy, stopping anything for the Patriots and David Bowie and spending summers in Martha's Vineyard. This mixture places me in a category that doesn't really exist, um, what in Brazil we'd call uma mistura, or a mixture. Last year, sitting where you all are right now, my awkward freshman self feeling uncomfortable, I tried to imagine where I fit. First, I'm not a woman, though I was assigned female at birth, but that's a whole other thing. But it was really the of color portion of the request that really made me aware of my mistura status. The Oxford American Dictionary defines a person of color as someone who isn't of white or European parentage. Given that, I technically do meet the dictionary definition of a person of color. But I'm also white. <laughs> Which boxes will I check on my college applications? How will they accept me if I can't be used to fill some sort of a quota? What does it really mean to be a person of color? Do my brown siblings, quote unquote, qualify me in some way as a person of color? Is the anti-immigrant sentiment my, father fa my mother faces in this country and the racism my stepfather faced while in college not enough to qualify me as a person of color? If color-based judgment is in my family history, how am I not a person of color? I stand surrounded by a bunch of white people who may look like me on the outside, but I still feel isolated. So in order to rectify that, I reflected on my previous school year, my awkward freshman self, um, and how I could better handle situations that provoke discomfort. So I decided to get more involved with our school's Latino club, join African American and Latino scholars, and take Portuguese medical interpretation. My efforts failed. First, I'm listed as white on my school record, thus I am barred from African American Latino scholars. I also found out on the first day of school this year that my Portuguese medical interpretation class got combined with Spanish medical interpretation. Also, <laughs> there were no other Portuguese speakers in Latino club. Not, again, none of my efforts worked. I'm a min minority within a minority. No one's at fault for this, don't get me wrong. I just haven't found other Brazilian students to well connect myself with. So for those of us that are here, I really do implore you to get involved with our community. We need to know each other and we need to know that we have each other's backs. Brazilians need more representation in Latino spaces. We need our voices to be heard. We need to stop being told that it's okay. You could probably follow along in Spanish anyway. We need to hold standards of our culture as being understood and respected. We live in a constant state of not fitting in. I'm too white to be a person of color, too Brazilian to be in Latino club, and way too queer for Latino comfort. My gender identity doesn't even exist in my mother tongue. Again, I'm your classic mistura. My family story is complex and diverse. Much more complex than I've described to you all right now, and more diverse than you can see from my white skin. We create the culture we want, right? Going forward, I want us to create a culture of asking questions, not assuming. I know that I'm not the only mistura at this school. We need to get to know each other more and be given the infrastructure to connect with each other. Ask questions. Look beyond the superficial appearances of our peers. See me for what I am. 
Ask me about my identity misturada or my mixed identity, and please ask others about theirs. Thank you. My name is William McCormick. I'm a senior, and I'm half Irish, half Japanese. Growing up, I never really questioned my ethnicity. Being raised by my parents and spending every day after school with my grandmother, I learned how to speak in Japanese and about Japanese history and culture from the youngest age. Being Japanese was just a part of me, and growing up, I never questioned it until high school. When I was a freshman, I decided to take Japanese, though being in a class with all older kids and with me being the only person with Japanese heritage, I felt immense pressure to succeed. This pressure, although made Japanese very stressful, it wasn't what broke me. The weeaboo culture at BHS was what did. A weeaboo, for those who don't know, is a person who retains an extreme obsession to Japanese culture, creating a vision of what Japan is, usually based on current pop culture and anime. Without a doubt, we do have a weeaboo population at BHS. It's obvious that the weeaboos are not trying to hurt people with malicious intent, though their obsessions and misconceptions of Japan as a whole hurt me so much. My mother, who only lived in Japan for her childhood, taught me what she remembered and loved most about Japan, this being food, culture, and 70s and 80s music. This, together with my grandmother's lessons on history and culture, culminated into everything that being Japanese means to me. Though, as I've realized through high school, not everybody deems this to make me Japanese or even Japanese at all. I realized this when we had a Japanese presentation on a celebrity in AP Japanese. Obviously, based on my mother's recommendation, I chose to present on the 70s superstar Iwasaki Hiromi. Though, as I saw slide after slide of niche J-pop slash anime celebrities that I didn't know, my self-consciousness about my Japanese identity grew. Though, what made it worse was, after my presentation, one person said to me that what I presented on wasn't real Japanese music. Someone said to me that my celebrity, who I idolized as a child, didn't create real Japanese music. Just because she's older doesn't mean she's any less Japanese. Hey, the Beach Boys are still American, right? This comment completely turned my world upside down. First, I couldn't believe that someone would question what my impression of Japan was. Though as well, it made me feel like the Japan I knew wasn't a real Japan and that I've been living a sham my whole life. Though worst of all, the person who told me this wasn't even Japanese. My anxiety when talking about Japan and even speaking Japanese got worse over time. Once as I was giving a presentation, one person said to me that the dialect I spoke in was a bad way of speaking and that another dialect was a way better way to speak in. The way I speak was passed down to me by my grandmother and my mother. A person who's not Japanese came up to me and said that the dialect I spoke in was bad. That's insane. Things like these make me feel so completely insecure about my Japanese heritage. I questioned whether I was really Japanese enough to call myself mixed race. Whenever I spoke in class or even to my mother, I felt reluctant and extremely nervous because everything I did was either too weird or too different from today's fetishized pop version of Japan that many Americans share. I love that Japanese culture is being learned about, though what frustrates me is that sometimes people want to stop at the surface level of it. Sometimes people feel so confident in what they know that they refuse to question the unknown. Though this unknown to the weeaboos across America is everything that Japan means to me. Also, people who aren't even Japanese telling me the way I thought about Japan, spoke Japanese, lived being a half Japanese person was wrong. That's crazy. I know I don't know the ins and outs of modern Japanese culture, pop culture per se, but that doesn't make me any less Japanese. What Japan means to me is what my mother and my grandmother have passed down to me, and I'm so proud of that. And I wouldn't want to change that in any way. Okay, my name is Tanelia, and my piece is called A Letter to My Younger Brother. To saying, growing up in America is not what you think. The color of your skin and your autism isn't going to make it any easier. Being born black, you already have baggage to carry. Not only do you struggle, but at times you are often dehumanized and look differently from people around you. And there's no way to change this. Now, I'm not saying that you can't make it far in life and succeed, or that every day you'll be misunderstood because of the color of your skin, but it won't come easy for you. I don't have a cruel story of me being detained by a cop or a racist spitting on me for just being me, but I will tell you a story I know of an average black man in America. 
born to a mother that had an unexpected early pregnancy, disappointment pouring out from her parents. But because of her kid, she now has to drop out of college and pick up some jobs, uh, pick up some hours at a job where she has no desire to do or even be. Most of the time, stressed about her finances and worries about when the next meal is going to come from or how to pay the bills. The father is either incarcerated, six feet under, or just a deadbeat father. The kid acts out in school because he has no one. He lacks a male figure in his life to show him how to actually be a black man in America. As he grows older and taller, he has looked more as a savage and people fear his innocence. Police brutality, racially profiling, living in dangerous cities, experiencing urban schooling is modern day slavery. This young man driving to the store only to be stopped and shot by a police officer. Protests held for this young man because there goes another one of our kind being killed. Police officer paid on leave and sent to court where he gets to keep his job and found not guilty. The justification is that the boy was pulling out a gun from a glove department only to be getting his registration for his vehicle. Well, I want you to know that there's not a lot of things that you could change. Do, uh, sorry. Well, I want you to know that there's not a lot of things that you could do to change the stigma that is already put upon you because of your race. And being smart could take you over so far. Sorry to be a negative Nancy, but it's true. It's reality. No matter what, love the skin that you're in and love the struggle that comes with it because that's what makes your story unique. That's what sets you apart from other people and that's what makes you stronger. To saying, I want you to know that I love your annoying ass and I'm here for you, I believe in you. Thank you. I'm going to tell you a story. It might be long, and I hope you don't find it boring. This is the tale of how I ended up here as a sort of East meets West. A ruby red dragon, you could say, in American dress. It started thousands of miles away where my grandparents grew up, the places transformed today into a glowing, progressive state civilization, a nation that conceals its own people's frustrations with skyscrapers in luxury second to none, where success blurs origin. And the Red Nouveau Riche began to forget where they came from. But back then, it was a different state of mind, filled with small villages and millions of people left behind. A bottleneck to success with no room to climb. First came British invasion and population subjugated with colonization. The dynasty, forced to grapple with a modern state of mind, centuries crumbled in seconds, its own empire declined. My great-grandfather, he grew up in this mess, found his way up the ranks, reached the top, drew a blank. Suddenly, he was forced to fight Japanese occupation, a sweeping militarization against his new young nation and a growing red impulse towards collectivization. Two evils he hoped with no correlation. My grandfather was only a little boy, watching his father from afar think of new strategic ploys, for they couldn't stay in one place. There was always a threat in a three-sided race. And so they arrived in Nanjing. They watched from afar as their brethren filled with a terror that never lessened as they were murdered and raped by a sick, twisted enemy with their own definition of great. The legacy of Nanjing never ceases in my mind. It echoes in rings. It is spiraling and sickening. My grandfather watched on through the violence and chaos he couldn't keep track of the things that he lost. He watched his, his own father, bled out by the red. He went home to find his sister, sitting quietly, dead. And this wasn't unusual, it was also surreal. And while the war numbed him, some feelings he feigned. The violence never managed to dull his pain. Finally, when the war came to a close, 
The Japanese left. The communists took hold. He had lost, but the fight wasn't done. They had to flee out of the country. They were forced to run. My grandfather, he was one of many children. But his father chose him to start a new life, leaving the others behind. They were out of time, out of luck, through emotional strife. And then there's me. And now maybe you can see why I'm on the fence and slightly defensive of a nation that violates human rights. The Middle Kingdom now exposed in raw light. My family may have been on the opposite side, but the red nation that failed to fail is still an integral part of my life. It frustrates me when people don't understand. How, I ask you, could I hate my homeland? My family, they've let it go. A process I don't think I ever will know. As I enter a world where I'm now a model minority, but there is so much more of me, I stand in defiance of laid back compliance. I won't forget where I came from, for what the future will bring, or of the time when my grandfather was a little boy in Nanjing. Thank you. Thank you all so much for coming to this assembly. Can we get one more round of applause for all the speakers? Thank you. We are so grateful that Brookline High School dedicates a space for students to speak their truths and fight for change. Have a good day, everyone, and we hope to see you in the other blocks. Thank you.